Hello, folks. Welcome to the next episode of Physics Live with Soborno and Rifat. Today, I have our exclusive guest, Soborno Isaac Berry, and we're going to be discussing physics. But first, we're going to start with an icebreaker. All right. So my icebreaker is going to be asking Soborno what is on the University of Cambridge website, and he's going to ask me what is on the website of the University of Oxford. So are you ready, Soborno? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go to the University of Cambridge website and see what's on their website and ask you to predict what's on their website. So, okay, I'm on their website right now. I see what's on there. Can you guess what is on the Cambridge University website? Um, there's a new advancement in biology. Um, that is incorrect. The Cambridge University website it has advanced a new technology for detecting fake news. Oh, can you guess what's on the Oxford website? Climate change. Nope. Uh, space exploration. Oxford welcomes this year's cohort. Find out about our range of graduate access initiatives, including research internships. Wow, okay, that's very nice. Okay, so, um, so for everyone joining right now, today we're going to be discussing something known as Lagrangian mechanics, which is, an alternative to Newtonian mechanics, but it predicts the exact same thing. Yeah. Why do we need Newtonian mechanics? Why do we need Lagrangian? So Newtonian mechanics is great. We use it to launch rockets. We use it for almost everything in our world, but it has some disadvantages, some limitations. For example, Newtonian mechanics doesn't work very well for systems with a lot of degrees of freedom. For example, even if you have a double pendulum, uh, which we're going to explore later on, that's very hard to predict the dynamics of using Newtonian mechanics. And also, Newtonian mechanics is not independent of your coordinate system. Lagrangian mechanics works in any coordinate system. And also, Newtonian mechanics doesn't work in electromagnetism, special relativity, or quantum mechanics, whereas Lagrangian mechanics does. Also, Newtonian mechanics doesn't work with non-inertial reference frames, whereas Lagrangian mechanics, you guessed it, does work with centrifugal or centripetal forces. So those are some of the advantages of Lagrangian mechanics over Newtonian mechanics. So if Lagrangian is this be all do all, then what's Hamiltonian mechanics for? Hamiltonian mechanics is, the Lagrangian is based on uh, the kinetic minus potential, right? No. Nope. But Hamiltonian is kinetic plus potential. <laughs> yeah, it's why do we... Tony and the Lagrangian does everything. Oh, well, we'll get to that. Okay. So, sorry, you know, I think you need to do a little more research. Okay. So, now before um, we jump right into the math, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the applications of Lagrangian mechanics, if that's okay with you. So, this is like a colloquium a few weeks ago. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about an application of Lagrangian mechanics. So just very briefly, I'm, I'm the speaker, um, and this is our esteemed guest today, and we're going to be discussing the action principle today. So what is the action principle? Well, it was motivated by a very simple problem. Uh, would you like to read the problem? What's the path that takes the shortest time? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's the fine that's the Bautista the problem, so. Well, most people would say, whoops, most people would say, that the fastest path is a straight line, right? Well, that's the path of least distance, not the path of least time. Very good. That's the path of least distance, but not the path of least time in a gravitational field, right? Uh, so if you introduce gravity into it, the answer gets a little bit more complicated. Is the path of least time a straight line? Is it a circular arc? Maybe it's some polynomial curve. Maybe it's some kind of a different path altogether. How can we figure out the path that takes the least time? Well, that is known as the Brachistochrone problem. What is the shortest time path between two points in a gravitational field? And this problem was posed by someone very famous, Johann Bernoulli. And it was solved not only by Bernoulli, but by someone you might know, uh, someone who's your namesake. Who do you think? Newton. That's right. Sir Isaac Newton solved the problem in a single day. And Galileo Galilei also tried to solve the problem, but failed. He thought that the path of least time would be a circular arc, which turns out not to be the case. So um, 
Bernoulli had a genius idea. And that idea was that there is something physical that already takes the path of least time. And that is light, right? Light uh, uh, obeys Snell's law everywhere. And by doing so, it takes the path of least time. One brown animation. That's right. That's a three blue, one brown animation. So that just gives you some brief motivation for, for trying to understand Lagrangian mechanics. So now we're going to delve into the mathematics. If you're ready, we're going to get started. And let me share my iPad screen. And let me know if you see it. Uh, okay. Yes, I do. OK, great. So let me first just close this tab. All right, we've got a lot of viewers. Thank you for tuning in. Let me just highlight some of the viewers' comments. Thank you, Tai Wo, for saying keeping up the good work. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, thank you uh, for everyone. And uh, OK, let's get into it. So here is my iPad screen. Let me make both of us a little bit bigger. And we're going to get started. So, so Borno, while I'm setting this up, you tell me a little bit about what you know about what we're going to do today, Lagrangian mechanics. What do you know? What have you heard about it? So what, from what I've heard, Lagrangian mechanics is an alternative method of doing mechanics, mainly based around the Lagrangian quantity, uh, T minus V. And the principle of least action relates to it in the way that we can calculate uh, the path of least action uh, using the Lagrangian. Because action is defined as some variable which is dependent on the Lagrangian through a relation that we will see a little bit later. Wow, that's fantastic. You explained it better than even I could. Sure, okay. maybe. So let's start with something very simple, okay? Let's say you have a ball. In fact, I'm going to zoom in. And so this is our ball, right? In fact, let, oh. me, let me use the color black so that um, I can change colors later on. So this is a ball. And here is my ground. Okay, so here's my ground. Here's my ball. Um, and I'm going to just ask a very simple question. Of course, we're on Earth, so there's some gravity, right? Yeah. So I'm going to ask a very simple question. Let's say that um, right now I've got my hands around this ball. I'm, I'm holding it. And let's say I let go. What? That must have been like a hand. Well, uh, that's a very deformed hand. So when I let go of the ball, what happens? What do you think? Uh, it's going to fall uh, in the direction of the gravitational field when it is down. So it's going to start at some point, at some point in at some position, at some point in time, and then a little later, it's going to move to some other position at some later point in time. Right. So it's gonna fall, 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 and then hit the ground. Be the dot. Right. So that's you're exactly right. So let's say it starts from a certain position. Let's call it position x1 at an initial time, let's say t1. And then by the time it reaches the ground, uh, what what coordinates would you give it? Can you give me some coordinates? x2, t2. OK. Very good. So basically, the ball goes from here to here, right? Oh my lord, I never knew that. Right. Now, what path does it take between these two points? Straight between line. Two? A straight line, exactly. So let me draw that straight line right here. So, wait, wait. So I want to ask you, why does it go in a straight line? Why does it go like this? Why does it go like this? Why does not it go like this? So for, at least for this system, I can say it goes straight down because there's only one force pulling it straight down. That's gravity. But, okay, what about a more complicated system, like a spring hanging on a double pendulum hanging on a conical pendulum? Well, for a more complicated system, let's say you have a double pendulum, something like this, then it gets a lot more complicated to predict what kind of path the system is going to pursue. For example, this uh, arm of the pendulum might go this way, while this arm of the pendulum goes that way, right? It's much harder to predict when you have more degrees of freedom in your system. So in that case, we need Lagrangian mechanics. Lagrangian mechanics helps us explain why the ball goes straight down like this, instead of going, for example, like this, or like this, or like this, right? 
Wow, some of these are ridiculous. Well, you can see that these could all be equally valid paths, but the ball only takes one path in hey, real wait. life. Yep. Small question. Yeah. I know this is uh, the path of least accident because it's the path of least distance, but what if the wind is blowing on that day? Would it deviate from the path and then go back to the original endpoint? Very good question. So if you have... He, like, oh, that wouldn't be the path of least distance. So... If you have a force, a resistive force, or a drag force like wind or friction or air resistance, then... Lagrangian mechanics is has to somehow take account of, of that resistive force. Usually resistive forces are not conservative, um, but if, if you add an extra term into the Lagrangian, uh, I'm not quite sure what that term would look like, but if you can somehow account for that frictional term by adding another term to the Lagrangian, that'll help you figure out once again, the path of least action, and that's the true path. All right. Yeah, well, what were you saying? I you were muted when I was talking. What? Okay. So now we're going to head into the math if you're if you understand everything so far. No. Yep. All right. So basically, let me draw a graph of what's going on. Okay. So this is a graph of position x against time t. Okay, I'm using X instead of Y. You can use Y if you'd like. It's just a nomenclature. So, um, oh, something. Do you see my iPad screen still? Or Yes, I there do. So what I'm going to do now is draw the path of the ball through phase space, through, through, um, through this graph. So where does the ball start off from? Where, what do, would you say? What is the initial coordinates of the ball? Oh my God, stop interrupting me. X1, T1 x1, t1, and endpoints? x2, t2. Okay, that's over here because x2 is at the ground. So what should the path between those two points look like? Well, I would say that it's a straight line, but that's not right because we're looking at it accelerating towards the ground because we're in a gravitational field. So that means that it's a curve that looks a little bit like this. Right, it's a parabolic trajectory, right? So it's like this, yep. right? Now the question mm -hmm. is, why is that the true path? Why can't the true path, for example, be this curve? Or why can't it be this curve? Or why can't it, it be this curve, right? Because it's accelerating in uh, that specific way. But also because those other curves are not the paths of least accent or rather the paths of least time. Right? Okay, so let's try to uh, explain this for people who are new to this idea. So there was this really amazing idea that uh, Lagrange and, um, and others came up with. And that idea was the idea of action. What is action? So action is a quantity, it's a number. It's just a number. And but I thought action was the word producers say when they tell you to start filming the scene. Right. So every path has an action associated with it. An action is just a number. So for example, this, do you see this uh, green path that I've made some space in? There were three green paths. So this green path might have an action of, I don't know, 4.6. Just a number, right? Yeah. This well, green, what yeah. Does what does it represent? So action is, it's not really a physical quantity like velocity or mass. I can't really intuitively explain what it is. I can only explain why it's useful to yeah. do physics in terms of it. What it is intuitively. Say it again. Why can't you explain what it is intuitively? Well, I can tell you that the action is defined as something, but it's not really an intuitive quantity. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use computer science analogy of big O? No. Um, oh, did someone ask me to do that? Uh, I don't think big O notation works. Okay, let, uh, let's see. Uh, no, if, if someone has a question, of course I can address it. So big O notation is to... Um, explain the complexity or the efficiency of an algorithm. Uh, it's not 
very applicable over here. Um, so that's why big O notation is not um, used in, in the action, but it's a, it's a good question. Oh, basic, big O basically represents the rate or type of growth that a function has in mathematics. Right. So I don't think it's applicable here. Right, right. That's big O notation. So, um, so now let's talk a little bit about what the action is since you brought it up. Action is defined as S is the variable for action and it's defined as the integral of the Lagrangian over time, okay? It's the integral of the Lagrangian over time. And of course, you can ask me any questions if I'm going too fast or too slow, feel free to stop me and ask me any questions. But that's the definition of the action. It's defined as the integral of the Lagrangian over time, okay? Yep. So every path that the particle could possibly follow has an action associated with it. This path, for example, has an action of 4.6. This path might have an action of, I don't know. But we don't know what those actions are. He's just giving some random numbers because we don't really have the time to go through the calculations of it all. Right. So, oh, did someone ask that question? No, I'm just bringing it up. Right, right, exactly. Uh, this path might have an action of, for example, just for uh, clarity's sake, four, right? So every path has a different action. But the path that the particle really takes is the path of? Least action. Least action. That's what I can say for certain. The, par the, path the particle can travel any path that it wants. It can travel any path. But the path that it really follows is the path with least action. Hey, I have a question for you. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'll write on this piece of paper, okay? Okay. But we know that in the simple system we have here, uh, the position as a function of time is just 9.8 t squared plus x1, right? Exactly. So what if we made a small modification, like 9.8 t to the 2.1? plus x to the one. So okay. how would that affect the action? So since that's not exactly the path of least action, but it differs from the path of least action by just a little tiny bit, it would be a little bit more or a little bit, oh, it would be a little bit more than the, than the path with the least action. So the path that you just gave me, for example, is just a little bit, would have a action that would be maybe 1.2, right? just a little bit more than the true paths action. Does that answer your question? Yeah, is this going to be important in something that we do later perhaps? Yeah, this is going to help us derive the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is going to help us find the path of least action, okay? The action is defined as the integral of the Lagrangian over time, but to actually find the path of least action, you need something called the Euler-Lagrange equations, and we're gonna derive it today. <clears throat> but before I do that, do you have any questions? Not yet. Okay, let me briefly check the audience. Uh, do they have any questions? Let us take a look. So we see um, T. Cuber uh, says, hello, Professor Isaac Newton Berry. And Rifas, I have a question for disturbing you. Okay, well, okay, let's go back to our uh, physics. So it seems like nobody has any questions. So yeah. this is the definition of the action. Now we're going to actually derive the Euler-Lagrange equation. So let us do that. So we seek the true path that a particle would follow, right? So let me yeah. draw that out. So let's say a particle starts from some initial and final trajectories. Uh, do you wanna give me coordinates for the initial and final configurations? Just x1, g1, x2, t2. Okay, good. So let me write that. x1, t1, x2, t2. And... Draw some arbitrary curve. Okay. Let's say that's the true path, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's say that's the true path. Uh, what do you want me to call the true path? I can call it anything you want. 
uh, f of x f or of f, of t, f of t f of t okay i'll call it uh, f of t okay all right so what happens if we just take a part of f of t and just pull it up a little exactly very good question so what if you take a part of f of t and just pull it up a little bit let me change the color a little over here and now let's do it. Let's consider what happens when we change our function. So let's say we have, uh, well. So let's say this is our path that deviates from the true path by just a little bit, right? What do we call that deviation? Well, that deviation right here that I'm going to show in purple See how it's different from the true path by just a little bit? Yeah. So that new path must be the old path plus some little deviation. Okay. Plus some de little deviation. But we have to have a control. We have to have a little knob that allows us to control how much we let it deviate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Why is that? Okay. And that little control I'm but I have a question for you about that. Okay. Why can't epsilon just be part of that function that you have? I'm pretty sure it's called eta. It actually can. And some people, in fact, instead of writing eta times epsilon, they just write a big fat function here like uh, n of t. Just combine it as one thing. But for clarity, for purposes of clarity, we're going to use uh, epsilon here. So for some elementary case, does eta of t have no coefficients or? That is a mathematical question. I'm not sure the answer to that. It's fine. So the true path is this one, the one that I've drawn in red. This is the true path. Would you agree? Yes. And this is a path that's just a little bit off from the true path. So it has an action that is just a little bit more. Okay, this is uh, not the true path, not true path, but it has an action that's very close, but not quite the least action, okay? Right. Okay, so now we're going to start deriving the Euler-Lagrange equation. I'm not sure why my iPad keeps lowering the brightness, but now we're going to do it. I have a small so, question. Yeah. So what if we take that change epsilon, let's make it really small, make it an infinitesimal change. Would that also make an infinitesimal change in S? Yes, exactly. That's what we're going to do right now. So the true path is the one with least action, right? Right? Yeah. So how can we find the least action? First of all, what is action defined as? You tell me. It's the integral of the Lagrangian uh, with respect to time or over time, not with respect to Right, exactly. And so how can we find the minimum action or how can we extremize the action? Well, you take the derivative on both sides. Very good. But take the derivative with respect to what? Time, epsilon, eta? Well, considering we're trying to uh, make S is... We are trying to make the action as small as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, action does not depend on time. Okay. The only thing it really depends on for a function is that modification or epsilon. Exactly. So what are we going to take the derivative of the action with respect Wait, to? Wait, does it also depend on eta? Eta, right. Oh. So why don't we take it with respect to eta? Okay, well, we can take the derivative of uh, the function with respect to eta, but think about it. S is a function. Eta is a function. I don't know how to take the derivative of a function with respect to a function. Do you know what oh, I mean? Or only uh, trying to take the derivative of a function with respect to a variable. Right, and that variable is going to be, as you correctly identified? Epsilon. Epsilon. So... We're going to, our job, our goal is to find the derivative of the function with respect to? Uh, wait, what? Oh, yeah. With uh -huh. respect 
Gotcha. We're taking Absol the derivative of the function with respect to? Epsilon. Epsilon. There we go. And so what is that going to equal? Hmm. Uh, well, it's going to be equal to the integral of L d s over uh, d epsilon. Well, just take the derivative of L also with respect to epsilon. Oh. And then put your dt, right? So we have the d. Oh. Right? Do you see that? Let me show you one more time. I no, just... that's me also not realizing. We're taking the derivative of the entire thing with respect to epsilon. Right. So that we have everything there. Right. Don't worry. If you're confused, then there's no hope for the audience. So <clears throat> what is this equal to? We want to extremize this. Zero. Uh, very good. It's equal to zero because that's going to help us find the extremums, the maxes, the mins, the stationary points. So this is equal to zero. Okay, now <clears throat> our goal is to figure out what this is. What is D, L, D, E? What is this thing? How can we figure out what this is? Well, we first have to start somewhere. Where? What? what? Say it again. What is L? Sorry? Can you write down what L is? Okay, so L is the Lagrangian. Can you tell people what the Lagrangian is in physics? Well, it's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Now, uh, people should write it K minus U, but they think they're so fancy and they've gone to a new level of physics because they learned Lagrangian mechanics, so they use T minus V instead, like the little privileged fools they are. And they don't even use V or A or dx dt anymore. They use this dumb dot notation uh, in order to symbolize derivatives. Very good. So <clears throat> what is the kinetic energy usually in physics? Half mv squared. OK. And of course, potential energy can be many things, right? It can be gravitational potential energy. It can be generalized gravitational potential energy. It can be spring potential energy. It can be electric columbic potential energy. It can be van der Waals potential energy. but Let's just assume we're in third grade. What is the potential energy? I don't think people learn about this third grade. That's right, MGX. Even you are one for goddamn time. So, what does the potential energy seem to depend on? Uh, well, X. Which so is? That, the Lagrangian is also a function of X, but. The Lagrangian also depends on V. So, but the all these fancy boys like to call V X dot. But the Lagrangian also depends on time because both position and velocity are functions of time. Very good, very good. Your excellence is impressive. So, so that's the original one. Now, what happens to everything when we just put up just a little bit? Very good. So if you change it by just a little bit, let's see what happens. Let me just move this a little bit. So our new Lagrangian is going to be, you tell me if you want. Uh, well, it's going to be L. X is uh, going to, hmm. oh yeah, epsilon N. And X dot is going to be uh, epsilon N dot plus epsilon n dot. But time stays unchanged by our modification right. because the modification to our function doesn't affect how time passes. Exactly. But it does affect our velocity and our position at certain points. That's right. This is velocity and this is position, right? Yeah. But there is something uh, really uh, important to note, and that's that uh, there is no modification to the starting points and ending points. Very good. So, Can you explain that for people? Because we're trying to get from one point to another. Those endpoints can't be changed by our modification. So that means we have to start at one place and end at another. So that means that our little alteration in our function, epsilon, eta, t, cannot affect we we start and stop. Exactly. So what is eta of t one? 
that's equal to um oh yeah that's equal to t1 that's equal to zero because as you said and it's because of the deviation yeah. right and eta of x1 is also zero eta of t2 is also zero right at t2 so far so good mm -hmm. okay yep. so um like a function of time, not oh yeah, oh damn. I should have seen that. Right. Man, I'm not good at reading things. Okay, so so this is where we're at. Okay. Yep. Just for um just for clarity, I'm going to call this new big position as big X. Are you okay with that? <laughs> Say it again. That's right. And I'm going to call this whole thing, uh, this uh, new velocity of the yes. new path. What should I call it? What do you want? Oh. X dot, right? I don't really have a choice. Stop using the highlighter. Okay. So that's where we're at. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So now this is what, uh, this is what we have to do. Remember our original goal was to figure out what this is, D L D E. What is the change in the Lagrangian as I as I do a little change to the true path? So yeah. that's our goal. So let's go back to our goal and try to figure it out. So I'm going to draw this over here, and we're going to write D L D epsilon is equal to what? If you don't understand Leibniz notation for some reason, then that means what? how much does our Lagrangian change if we do an infinitesimal little pull? If we change uh, epsilon just a little bit, if we deviate from the true path by an infinitesimally small margin. That's right. So DL, very well explained, by the way. So DL, DE, what is the change in our Lagrangian as we make a very small change in our true path, right? Yep. So let's try to figure out what this is. So first, let me write down what my Lagrangian is right now. It's L is a function of big X, big X dot, and time. So if I wanna figure out how my Lagrangian changes with respect to epsilon, I have to figure out what parts of the Lagrangian depend on epsilon. So let's take a look. Does x, does big X depend on epsilon? What do you say? Yes. Okay, so how does big, yeah. Yeah, it does depend on epsilon because big X is just little x plus that modification, which is based on epsilon. And epsilon's quantity basically shows just how big that modification is. So if epsilon is really big, then the action becomes huge and our function is far away from our real path. Yeah, like what he just drew. Uh, meanwhile, if epsilon is small, then it'll only deviate a little from the true path, like what he drew originally. That's right. So very good. This big X, the new position, does in fact depend on epsilon, right? Yeah. So we need a, a term for that in our derivative. So we have to say, okay, how much does our Lagrangian depend on big X? And then how much does big X depend on epsilon? So far, so now, good. Now, some people might be confused by those funky monkey symbols that we just started using. Those are the partial derivative symbols. And those are shown because uh, for the partial derivative of L over the partial derivative of X, that is because L doesn't just depend on X. L uh, L depends on X, but it also depends on other factors, like X dot and T. So the partial derivative is used to show that if we consider X dot and T as constant, how much X uh, changes L. And similar fashion for the partial of X over epsilon, X does not just depend on epsilon. I'm pretty sure it also depends on eta, but we know what we can't take the derivative. Wait, so what is the partial derivative of X over epsilon? Is there any other factor that X depends on? Yeah, so for example, what is big X, if not small X plus eta 
uh, sorry, ta plus epsilon eta, right? And yeah. small x okay. could be, for example, have gt squared plus eta as uh, eta times epsilon. So big X is also a function of time, for example, right? You can see that over here. Oh, okay, that makes some sense. And of course, eta is also a function of time. So, so as you can see, um, that's why we use the partial derivative instead of the full derivative. Wow, you're actually a really good explainer. Thank you, and you're a very good. Okay, so moving on. So you didn't know that person in general. So a very good student. So Please? now does X dot depend on epsilon? Okay, explain. Um, in the same way that X does, X dot also has that little deviation of epsilon times or or eta dot. <laughs> right. So what should I write my partial derivative term for x dot s? Wait, why does it have to be specifically eta dot? Why can't we make another function as that little change in uh, x dot? What do you mean? Wait, why is the change in x dot specifically uh, epsilon eta dot? Why can't it be epsilon times some other independent function? Well, because you see, x, so good question. Maybe this will help you understand. What is big X equal to? Big X is little x plus epsilon uh, eta. Right. Now, I should be more clear what this actually is a function of. Big X is a function of time, um, time and other things, right? And yeah. small um, x. Absolutely. Right. Plus uh Epsilon times eta t. I mean epsilon, but is epsilon a constant? Yeah, epsilon is a constant, right? Wait, so how can something be a function of epsilon if it's, epsilon? Sorry, is it's not a function of epsilon. Oops. So well, then you write the partial derivative of x over epsilon a little bit up there. Yeah, that. Why do you write that Which one? This one. Yeah. Well, epsilon is constant, so right. But we take the derivative of big X with respect to the, uh, with respect to epsilon. We can change epsilon, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah. In, in any calculation, in a, in any single calculation, it's kind of a constant. I'm reading right now, sorry. Right. So, you asked why is X dot the way it is? Well, just take the derivative of this. So, X small X becomes X dot. Uh, epsilon is a constant, so it doesn't change, but eta is not a constant, so there you go. Oh, so, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. So okay. that's taking with respect to time. Right. All right. Whenever you see the dot, it always means derivative with respect to time. Yeah, so do we just write uh, partial L over partial X dot times partial X dot over partial epsilon? That's exactly right. So, partial x dot over oh, partial. I know you have that word within you to write that curvy x. Do it. Right. No, no. Okay. So great. So this is what we have so far. Now, does time also depend on epsilon? Oh. Why? Uh, time uh, in the flow of time cannot be altered uh, by eta or epsilon. Uh, time, uh, time's passing will always be constant. And uh, epsilon eta only alters the function. It doesn't alter how time passes. In fact, uh, eta is a function of time. So, okay. yeah. Very good. Very good. So, this uh, is, yeah. So, this is the derivative we've been looking for. The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to a little change, a little deviation in our true path. DL, D epsilon. Okay? So, this is what we have been looking for. This is what we need to plug in. This, oh, whoops, I was using eraser. Uh, this is what I really wanted, right? Yeah. So let me just draw a box around it because it's a big, big deal. So this is what we're going to plug in into our action differential. So what was our action differential? This thing right here, right? Close. But now we know a big piece of that. DLDE is just this. 
Well, yeah, but it almost looks like you're making it more complicated, no? So, right. So, all I have to do now is say that DSDE, let me write it over here. DS. So, remember, the action is the integral of the Lagrangian over time. That means the derivative of the action with respect to a little change in our path of least time is DL DE, right? But we've just figured out what DL DE is. It's this big fat thing. So I'm going to uh -huh. take this. I'm going to take this thing, copy it. That, that might be offensive. Right, exactly. So I'm going to take this and write it over here. So DS d epsilon is the integral of dl d epsilon dt just write that exactly but what is dl d epsilon if not a dl dx please get out of typing mode oh there we go so you see that right you sure are lazy <laughs> so i'm going to take this put it right here that's what we have been looking for all this time, right? And the math is, you can see the math is very simple. Nothing more than basic addition and subtraction at most. So hopefully this is simple for the viewers to follow. Yeah, can't you split this up into two separate integrals and do uh, end by part? That's what we're going to do right now. So first of all, before I do that, um, it turns out that taking the derivative Oh, hell, bro. He's referring to his lecture notes. So, um, first of all, before I do that, um, it turns out that after you've uh, you've done this, let's t first take. Uh, okay, so, what is big X? You tell me. Big X is just little X plus epsilon eta. And what is big X dot? Uh, it's X dot plus epsilon eta dot. So can you tell me what partial x partial epsilon is? What is the derivative oh. of this with respect to epsilon? Oh, okay. So wouldn't that just be eta? Very good. It would just be eta, right? Uh, while we're doing it with respect to epsilon, we regard x as a constant, and then we have eta, which is also regarded as a coefficient, and then epsilon. So when we take the derivative of a coefficient times our variable, then it just leaves us with that coefficient, and that's why we get eta out of it. Right. And now can you tell me what partial x dot partial epsilon is? Uh, same dang thing, uh, eta dot. Eta dot, right? Eta dot. Explain again why. Uh, because when we're taking the derivative with uh, respect to epsilon, then we regard x dot as a constant. We regard epsilon as a variable, and we regard n uh, eta dot as a coefficient. So when we have a coefficient times a variable, and we take the derivative, then we just get the coefficient back. Very good. So now you tell me if this is okay, but now. Can I write, I'm going to put that over here. Uh, let me make, my, make some room for myself. Now, can I write, and you tell me if this is okay, ds, the change in the action, after I do a little deviation from the true curve, from the true path of least action, can I write this? Partial, uh, partial L, partial big X, times eta plus partial L, partial big X dot, times eta dot and- Well, we just, well, that was valid, no? Right, so that's why we can write that. Now, after we've done the derivative of big X with respect to epsilon and big X dot with respect to epsilon, we can actually just write um, lowercase x instead of big X over here, and lowercase you, x dot you, instead of you, big X dot there. And uh, we'll you, just, yeah. Brief explanation because some of us might be confused on the bunga. I thought th this was like a huge deviation a while ago. Now we can essentially set them equal to each other. Why? Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and Please just give a brief explanation. Um, well, the truth is that this is a, a common kind of step that's skipped in most textbooks, and hence I do not know why it's why it's done. Uh, 
But anyway, after you've taken these derivatives, there's basically no difference, right? Because after you basically said, okay, this is how much big X changes with epsilon. Very nice. When you don't know something, you just say you don't know. Okay. So, okay, so moving on. Um, but basically, after you've taken the derivative of big X and big X dot with respect to epsilon, I mean, why bother keeping big X along anymore? Just put little x. Maybe the answer is found somewhere in some hidden stack of change. All right. Story. So we have this. And so now what we're going to do is try to break this one down. You see this, this term over here? Yeah. What do you see? What is this term? Can you please explain? Well, it's the partial derivative of L over X dot uh, times E to dot. Okay, we're going to try to write this term using only eta dot and x, not eta. Uh, we're only going to try, we're going to try to write this term in terms of just eta and x, not eta dot and x dot, okay? We're going to try to get rid of the derivatives. What about the L? Oh yeah, of course we keep the Lagrangian. I mean, this is Lagrangian mechanics, but we're going to try to get rid of the eta dot and the x dot and replace them with eta and x. Okay. Okay. Let's so, see how that. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. So to do that, I'm going to need a little tool. I'm going to need to borrow a little tool from your calculus, and that is the product rule. E. Oh, so, never mind. The product rule. Okay. Right. So if I take the derivative of the product of two functions, what do I get? You tell me. Uh, you get uh, the derivative of one times the other plus the derivative of the other times one. Exactly. Now let's say I integrate both sides with respect to time. Yeah. Right? So I uh, integrate this side with respect to time and this side with respect to time. So, Wait, so don't the d and the d over dt cancel out, or is it just some little quirk of a line yeah. notation? Yeah, so this is just another common misconception. If these cancel out, yeah, I mean, then, uh, yeah, that's a big misconception in Leibniz notation. It looks like this is a fraction, so you can actually cancel that out, but don't do that. Don't do that. Makes me mad. So the, we're taking the definite integral of both sides with respect to time. Oh, you have a question? No. Uh, the live feedback giver is, yeah. Okay. So now, oh, okay. So now what we're going to do is ask ourselves the following. What is the integral of a derivative? You tell me. So they cancel out. Exactly, right? The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us the integral of a derivative is just the original function. So you tell me what I should write. Uh, so we should have uv uh, from t1 to t2 on that side. Evaluated at t1 and t2, okay. Obviously assuming here that u and v are functions of t. They are. Right? And then we have u prime v plus uv prime, which is a little tricky. Yeah. So we have T1 to T2 of U prime V DT, of course. I'm separating it as two integrals. Is that okay? We, we, is that right there is IVP, just with rearranged terms. Exactly. Exactly. So, so far, so good. You understand? I says from T1 to T2, UV from DT equals UV from T1 to T2 minus the integral from T1 to T2, U prime V DT. Well, actually, now I'm going to write write this just as you see IBP. Ready? Yeah. You want to see how I'm going to do that? I'm going to take yeah. this term, bring it over to this side. Indeed, you do. And there we go. So let Is me. Yeah, you hold. Right. So this is minus, because I bring that integral to the other side from T1 yeah. to T2. You tell me what I write. Uh, you find D. Wow, you switch pens faster than black and red pen. Uh, and finally, that's equal to T1 to T2 UV prime, DT. 
Okay, so boom, we've just got integration by parts in our hands. Now, why would we do this? Well, just check out what happens if you let the following happen. Let u equal eta dot and v prime equal, uh, sorry, not v prime, just let v equal, let me scroll up here. Let's say v is equal to partial l partial x dot. Okay, so far so good. I'm just letting u equal something and v equal something. So far so good? Huh? Are you okay with this? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to let u and v equal this. And I'm going to ask you, that's right, you, what the integral from t1 to t2 of u, what is u in this case? Uh, uh, e dot. A e dot. And V prime? Uh, D, T of uh, partial of L over X dot. Very good. Very good. Because now you recognize that the dot notation means derivative with respect to time of V, which is partial yeah. L, partial X dot. Right? Yeah. So X, for example, in just position, X dot is the derivative, which is velocity, mm -hmm. and dot is acceleration, which is the derivative of velocity, and x triple dot, which no one really cares about, is jerk. Right, right. So, okay, very good. So this is what we've got so far. Now you fill me in on what this is equal to. I'm actually going to move this to, the, uh, to this side, so that'll actually make it easier for me to write. So you tell me, what is this integral equal to? Uh, all right. So that's equal to eta dot? Eta dot, okay. Times. Okay. A partial L over X dot. Okay. Evaluated from T1 to T2. Okay. Minus. Minus. The integral from T1 to T2. Okay. Of eta dot dot. Uh, whoops. Did I, one second. Is it not the dot dot? Um, hang on, wait, 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 wait. Um, okay, so this is u prime b, and I should be okay. Okay. Um. Okay, so seems like uh, we have to backtrack a little bit. Um, I should have chosen something different for my u and v. So instead of solving for u v prime, I should have solved for u prime v. So allow me to correct my mistake right now. So wait, so what is it? Isn't it eta dot dot? Yeah. So that's you see. After you said that, I realized there must have been a problem because there's no way we can have eta dot dot. So I solved for the wrong guy. I'm gonna put this guy out here, and this guy out here. Tell me if you think that's okay or if that's illegal. Um, I'm pretty sure think? that's okay. Okay, how do you think I got that? Uh, you just uh, took the UV prime and put it on the other side. Very good. Now I'm just going to say that U is eta. So now can you tell me uh, one more time if you're patient? Uh, well, what... if U is eta, then should V be partial L over partial X, not partial L over partial X dot? No, I'm asking what should this right-hand side be? You have to modify the V as well. No, no, I don't. Trust me, I don't. It works out. But scroll up, scroll up. Okay. You see here, we have a partial L over partial X times eta. So, but you put V as partial L partial X dot. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. Wait, but that's not the term that we're multiplying. Yeah, it is. Uh, oh, because you see eta instead of eta dot. Yeah, so shouldn't v be the same? Shouldn't v no. be partial l over partial x? No, remember, we're trying to replace this term right here, right? This term? So why do we use eta instead of eta dot? Just hold on. What is this? Oh. What is that? Oh my God! Uh, it's eta dot times partial L over partial X. Exactly. Now do you see? 
You're a very funny man. Thank You're you. a very funny man. So this is dt. Uh, and now what is that equal to? That's equal to eta. Eta. Times partial L, partial X. Uh -huh. No, partial L, uh, X dot. Okay. Evaluated from D1 to D2. Oh, I'm just realized. Yeah. We talked earlier about the thing that eta T2 and eta T1 are both to zero. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, fine. Okay, and then? And then minus the uh, integral from D1 to D2. Mm -hmm. uh, eta dt. Eta. Are you sure it's eta? Yeah. Okay. Dt. No, D over dt. Okay. Uh, partial L over x dot. Okay. And then there's something you're missing. Oh, dt. Okay. Very good. Why you write L it almost looks like H? <laughs> Thank you. So now you might think, why did we do this? How did we do this? Well, the how is answered by integration by parts. The why is answered by, well, we want to replace this term, right? Yeah, but remember the evaluation thing. Let's go Eta. there. E2 is zero. So explain to me why this term right here is zero. Well, we did it before. Eta of T2 is equal to eta of T1, and they're both equal to zero, because we have to have the same start point and end point. When we modify our function, we can't modify those end points as well. Right, right. Very good. So coming back here, if we actually plugged in eta of T2, and let me just write this out for the people who are confused like I once was when I was reading Taylor, chapter 3.6. And if I write this out, then you'll see, of course, eta of t2 is zero, eta of t1 is zero, zero times anything minus zero times anything, that's zero, right? <laughs> wow, you're coming through crystal clear. Keep speaking. Okay, so this right here is zero, as you've just explained. So that means what is the integral from t1 to t2 of eta dot partial L partial x dot dt? What is that equal to? Mm, uh, that's equal to minus. Okay. Minus? Uh, the integral of, from t1 to t2. Mm -hmm. Of eta d d t over x dot d t. Okay, let me just bring this minus sign inside. Is that okay with you? So now we can just replace. Now we can just replace this entire guy with this entire guy, right? Yep. So let me just zoom out. Instead of writing partial x, partial l, partial x dot times eta dot, we can write this guy, right? Yep. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and do that. So uh, let me zoom in back here. Actually, let me copy this. No, let me zoom in right here once more. So uh, we have... This is equal to the integral of partial L partial X times eta plus, now instead of writing this, what can we write? You tell me. Uh, what? Okay. Uh, instead of writing this, we can write minus eta. Okay, minus, uh, minus eta. Wait, minus eta. D, D, T. D, D, T. Partial L over X dot. Partial L over partial X dot. And don't forget, e yeah. E what happened? E See, can you come closer to your mic? Because otherwise they can't hear you. E I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying, but um, what this is equal to, this entire thing, 
is equal to zero. Oh, D DT? Okay, um, Shaborno, your mic is not working, I think. So let me mute and unmute you. Now it's working. You have to come very close. Bring your chair in. Otherwise, that's unprofessional. Don't do that. Okay. So now we're going to um, we're going to factor out eta from our integral, and you tell me what I'm gonna get. So factor out eta, and then what's inside? Tell me. Oh shit. Um. Uh, partial L over X mm -hmm. minus DDT partial L over uh, X dot. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the Euler Lagrange equation. That's a look. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, this yeah. right here is, is the Euler. Lagrange equation. And now we have just derived what Mr. Euler himself derived. And sometimes you might say this, um, don't do that in, in front of, so sometimes you might also see this written as partial L partial Q, uh, where Q is the generalized coordinates of your, of your system. And so this right here is the Euler-Lagrange equation. And we've just derived it. So now we're going to solve a couple of problems using the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we're going to solve a very simple problem. Don't worry. It's just the problem of a ball in free fall. So here's a ball and it's in free fall. It's in a gravitational field, right? So, so Marno, tell me, what the Lagrangian for this ball is? Well, it's potential energy at the beginning. Wait, first, just... what, is, what is the definition of the Lagrangian? T minus V. Okay, first tell me what T is. Kinetic. What is? Uh, uh, kinetic energy. Oh, kinetic energy. Yeah, which is? A half mv squared. Very good. Minus potential, which in this case is mgh. M G, okay, M G X, right? Now, can I instead of writing V, what can I write? Uh, X dot. Very good. Man, you think you're just so cool because you could write X dot instead of V, huh? So you think you... you're because so... you can write X double dot instead of A, huh? Right. So, are you comfortable with this Lagrangian? Yes. Tell me right now what the Euler Lagrange equation is. <laughs> Uh, partial L over partial X. Well, it's okay if you've forgotten. Let's just arrive it one more time. So <laughs> I'm joking. So the whole point of deriving it is that it's so traumatic to derive, you'll never forget it again. So just, just look at this. Partial L over partial X equals DPT partial L over <laughs> Okay, so partial L, partial X, and then? Is equal to minus uh, DDT. Partial L over X dot. And of course, if you're looking for intuition for this, we can just go through the derivation. But if this add it again. Right. So this is our Euler Lagrange equation. And we're going to use this right now. So Saborno, tell me what our Lagrangian is. Uh, at this point in time, because uh, we have no kinetic energy, uh, then our Lagrangian is just minus mgx. Actually, you don't care what point in time you're thinking about. Just We just take this Lagrangian as is, and we're going to plug it in. That's it. So let's plug it in. The partial derivative of Lagrangian over x is minus mg. Well, okay, minus mg, sure. And then minus d d t of okay. Uh, well, a half well m x dot. Okay, good. And that's... oh, and d d t of m x dot, it just m x dot dot. 
Okay, very good. So mg minus mx double dot. We oh so g equals minus a or g equals minus x dot dot. Okay, so what is x double dot? Minus d. So what is x dot? Uh well it's minus g t. Minus g t. Don't forget to add a integration constant. And what is x then? Thing is, is this is starting from rest, no? It's starting from rest, right? But just generalize it. So okay. and integral want... again. So wouldn't this be minus half g t squared plus v not t plus x initial? Wait, I've seen that equation somewhere. Me too. I think I've seen that somewhere too. So I think we've just derived one of the kinematic equations straight from the Euler-Lagrange equation. Let's derive the other three kinematic equations. So first, yeah. we're going to start in spherical coordinates. And so first we have to rewrite our Lagrangian in terms of spherical coordinates, which is very simple. It only takes about half an hour. And so we're going to start that right now. So remember that the Lagrangian and rectangular, all right, I'm just joking. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining me along on this ride. Uh, right now, I'm going to end our talk by showing some simulations to our audience. So um, let me show some simulations. It seems like the simulations have died out from my talking, but let me just show, show you nonetheless. So do you see the simulation of um, kinetic and potentials? Yes, I see you, please. Okay, so that's, um, that's uh, now let me, run my reflection simulation. So um, you're going to actually see the action. Okay. Well, folks, um, I just want to thank you for joining me on our on our live session of math and science. Uh, thank you for watching this episode of Lagrangian mechanics. And uh, yeah, so next time we're going to also be talking about Hamiltonian mechanics and that kind of thing. So thank you for watching and uh, we're going to see you next time.